Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. I'm joined by Dan, who you can occasionally find on the Fulhamish podcast to get his thoughts on all things Fulham ahead of our game on Sunday. Dan, your season, um, is it good? Is it what you expected? Are you a little bit disappointed? What are you thinking of your season thus far? I, th- I think that's one of those things that no Fulham fan really knows the answer to. It's sort of been great at times. I mean, probably sim- I mean, sim- similar to West Ham, really, isn't it? But it's like at times it's been been fantastic, and it, it feels like we've progressed. And then other times you look at some of our results, and particularly you know, how the summer transfer window went, probably the January one as well. And it felt like with the players that went out and the players that came in, we regressed slightly. And so I think thirteenth, where we're at, at the moment, is probably a fair position in terms of. How we've played as a whole, we probably don't deserve to be much higher. We've had some great results against some bigger sides. And then we followed that up by losing to Burnley, you know, not being able to beat Sheffield United at Bramall Lane, which is unheard of. Um, so I think there's it's probably a fair position to be in. But disappointment, I think, probably overall, just based on how great last season was to finish 10th as a, a newly promoted side. And then to sort of follow that up by regressing slightly i think everyone's probably just on the side of disappointment i would say yeah he beat some average teams as well such as spurs but um don't worry <laughs> we also didn't win at bramble lane so at least we're you're in fine company on this podcast that makes, <laughs> makes two of us um in terms of sort of the, the you know you said there's been some good bits and some bad bits what have been the good bits I mean, I think if if you take yeah the Spurs victory for a start, winning three 0 at home against Spurs was great. Particularly as I think they were they were probably in a decent run of form at that point in the season, and then winning at Old Trafford, which we hadn't done in a very very long time, was was huge for us as well. I think those are some of the the highlights that instantly come out. Also, I mean, <laughs> sorry to bring it up, but the the back to back five nil wins we had uh, in the run up to Christmas was it, it was it came out of nowhere. It sort of made no sense because we lost three games on the bounce after those two 5-0 wins. But that was a, a fun part in the season where actually everyone turned around and wondered maybe could we turn a corner. Uh, but I, I think those those are probably the highlights. And and otherwise, there's been sort of games where we've we've crept through and, and then some disappointing results in there. As I mentioned, like the, the Burnley one in particular, I mean, take, taking one point off Burnley this season has been been pretty rough. And then losing away at Nottingham Forest a few weeks back, it just, it's been very, very up and down. And I think we've really struggled to get any sort of consistency, which is why we're where we are. But I think it's also quite a symptom of the teams from West Ham to, to us in 13th. No one seems to have really put enough of a run together to just be like, we're going to claim that Europa League or Europa Conference League spot because we're just going to pick up points and we're going to keep going. Everyone seems to be dropping points in that region. Yeah, I completely agree. This is what I've been saying. It's almost like a mini relegation battle. And when you're in the relegation battle, you're constantly looking out for each other's results. And it's like, who can do the least crap? And there's an element of that going on recently in the European run. It's like, who can stop dropping points for a change and go on? And still, with six, seven games to go in the Premier League, it's still up for grabs. Seven's up for grabs. Six is now up for grabs. Eight is up for grabs. There's still a lot to play for in that little region. In regards to the transfer windows, you suggested that you've maybe got worse as a, as a result of the two. Obviously, Mitrovic left. Um, apart from that, was there any big losses to Fulham? That that was the, the big one for us. I think there, there was a lot of decent movements in the transfer window. When, and if you take that Mitrovic move out, we brought in some some really good players who have improved us immeasurably. So, I mean, Calvin Bassey's come in and played at that left side centre-back and he's been superb, a, a revelation really. And he's taken over this mantle that Tim Ream had as our, our left centre-back. He's been doing it for the past 10 years, but it sort of became time for him to phase out and Bassey's done brilliantly in that role. And then Alex Awobi, who's a, a personal favourite of mine, I, I was really excited when he came in and he's shown loads of moments to, to show just how good a player he is. He, he's sort of one of those players that I can never quite explain to you why he's good, but he makes us, every time he plays, Fulham play better. And, and I think that's one of the things that he brings to this team. But with Mitrovic going out, we just had such a, a hole up top and it's taken until February for us to work out how to to score goals, how to replace his goals. And it's come through in Rodrigo Muniz, who is a player we signed three years ago and has never really got a sniff at Fulham. He went out on loan to Borough last year, started at the beginning of the season and then got dropped and, and was basically not in the squad at all in the, the second half of Borough's season. Start of this season, he, he was nowhere as well. I mean, he was he was 
times on the bench, but sometimes left out the squad completely. And then February rolls around just after we signed Armando Breuer on loan from Chelsea. And Muniz has been unable to stop scoring. And it's probably something that hasn't fitted through into the West Ham universe at the moment. But he won Player of the Month in the Premier League this, this month, which is insane, given that he hadn't scored a Premier League goal until February. Uh, so he, he's been a, a wonderful sort of resurrection story he's he's come for i think we'd all written him off we'd all decided that we'd probably wasted eight or nine million pounds on him so that was that's been a lovely redemption story there but otherwise i think it's a lot of the old guard that were doing good things for us last season uh, have continued that sort of good work this season players like willian who again marco silver specializes in the written off Premier League players, players who have seemingly had their chance and, and their time has gone. So Willian and Andres Pereira are a couple of examples of that who I think have, have really shone under silver. But even, uh, you know, you, you add in players like Anthony Robinson, who I think is probably for most Fulham fans our player of the season. He, he's been at the club for four or five years now. So it, it's the transfer window is one of those where... And again, it's windows that West Ham have had where you think oh, maybe there's a chance for us to kick on here. And it, it just didn't quite happen for us this year. But I think there's, there's promising signs going underneath it that maybe this summer we can correct that. In regards to your manager, Marco Silva, what do you make of him? What's your opinions on your gaffer? I, I just really struggled to find a bad word to say about him, really. I mean, the past three years since he took over, he took over from from Scott Parker and, and things were really dark at that point within Fulham. You know, we were playing really turgid, uninspiring football. We'd just been relegated from the Premier League again. And there was a, a summer of, you know, sort of stories swirling around Parker. Was he staying? Was he going? And it, it all sort of, he left in a, in a really bad way. And, and Silver's come in and since the first day, really, we've been on a completely different course, different trajectory. We've played some fantastic football. I mean, particularly in the championship, we were playing some of the best football we've ever seen at Fulham. And then it was great to see a manager, the first one we've had in the past 15 years, who was actually capable of adapting a very good championship team into being a good Premier League team. He made the tweaks. He understood that we weren't going to dominate every game like we did in the championship. And he just made us a very solid Premier League side. And I think it's the point now where people look at Fulham and no longer look at us as a yo-yo club which is yeah. interesting because I mean last last year was our first year back and I think it's it's easy to forget that we've only been back this is only our second season under Marcus Silver in the Premier League but it's been fairly sort of solid and standard and I don't think it's no one is surprised to see Fulham where they are at the moment because he has just turned us into a, a solid upper mid table pushing to the top half of the table side and and that is all we wanted, really, as Fulham fans. We, you know, we, we were fed up of the jokes. We were fed up of, of getting relegated every other season. And so it's so nice to have that stability. And I think he's just a, a superb manager and he showed his credentials. I think there is probably a worry within the fan base that's, that's growing that he may be on his way out at some point. We've got questionable ownership um, there's there's some issues with how we do our transfer business and it, it's riled up managers. It's rubbed our managers up the wrong way over the past 10 years. And there's a sense that maybe it's done that to Marco Silva as well. So we're worried if, if someone comes in with an ambitious project, he might be tempted. But at the moment, I mean, he is currently sat alongside Roy Hodgson, basically as in the shout for our best ever manager in the modern era, at least. And we're probably one trophy or one run away from that you know Roy Hodgson will always have his Europa League run and and this season we had our Carabao Cup run that we I think if, if we'd have won the Carabao Cup this year Marco Silva would have sat as as top full of manager in my lifetime and, and past few generations at least. Love that um, in terms of yourself then when you speak about retaining Marco Silva and you're worried if a club with ambition comes in what is that is that a team let's just be blazer here is that West Ham? Because obviously there's a question mark over David Moyes' future at the minute. Marco Silva has been linked to West Ham. It's believed that our chairman has been a fan of Marco Silva previously. If West Ham were to, to let David Moyes go at the end of the season, would you be concerned if we came knocking for him or do you think you'd be able to hold on to him? I think there would be concern in the fan base and West Ham are one of those teams that have been mentioned as, as a place he could go. I think your finances are slightly 
larger than ours. Not that you've necessarily got a richer owner, but I think that the history that sits behind West Ham as a stable Premier League club for longer means you've just built up a stronger financial position. We're still constantly teaching on the edge of that PSR because we've had championship seasons in the past which reduce the amount that we're able to spend. So because of that, we're sort of hamstrung slightly in the transfer market. So I think that it would be attractive, the prospect of having a little bit more money. There's obviously the European factor as well. I think if, if you guys were to get back into Europe, that, that would be an attraction as well. I think from my side, something I'd cling on to is maybe that Marco Silva's made these moves already in his career, where, and it, it, with all respect, it's not a huge step up. It's it's still, it's still a, on the grand scheme of things, a step up, but he was making these moves from you know, Hull to Watford to Everton that were little movements forward in his career, and they never seemed to actually really work out for him. And I think my worry would be more watching Marco Silva move to the continent, potentially. You're looking at, you know, top teams in Portugal that he's managed before, potentially teamed in Spain or Italy. I think he's perfectly capable of, of walking into a Champions League level side. And and I think those opportunities may exist in Europe more so than than in England. I don't think that sort of anyone who finishes in that top four would be looking for, for Marco Silva right now. Has he been linked to Sporting, given the, the manager linked to Liverpool? Has he been... We've not seen the domino effect, no, not yet. But I think I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was something on the radar. But again, it's it's one of those things where, you know, Fulham are, are signed players from Sporting in the past and they're the players that are top for Sporting. So there's, again, a question of whether that's a, a step up or just a sort of yeah. a, a, a slight lateral movement. So I think I think there's there's worry within the fan base. I'm not overly concerned right now, but it massively hinges on whether he gets backed in the transfer market. Because I think ultimately, if we see a summer like we saw last season, I wouldn't be surprised if he walked. And I also wouldn't blame him because he's a very good manager who shouldn't have to to deal with some of the, the bureaucracy that, that goes on within Fulham. Right, I've got a boring question for you regarding your tickets because of a comment I made in the preview. I've set myself up for that, but I'm going to deal with that at the end because it won't be everybody's cup of tea. So last question about Fulham for now. For anybody that hasn't watched you recently or much at all this season, which players would you say are in form and to look out for? Well, I think, I think we, we've touched on on Rodrigo Muniz, Premier League Player of the Month. He's he's an interesting one. He's awkward. He's a bit chaotic. He's still young and, and full of energy. So you're going to have a centre forward who lobs himself about a bit, makes a nuisance of himself. He's He looks really horrible to play against because I think you're never quite sure what he's going to do next. He's not maybe technically the most perfect striker, but he has sort of the similarities to Mitrovic in the way that he's able to use his body well, he holds the ball up well. And in the box, he's he's really quite lively. So he's one to watch out for. But I mean, for me, I think player of the season so far, as I mentioned, is Anthony Robinson, our left back. And he is crucial to, to how this Marco Silva side play. We we get our wing backs really high forward. They overlap down, down the left and right. And Anthony Robinson is a ridiculous athlete. I, I mean, his ability to get up and down the left is is insane and sometimes end product lacking, but it's very rare you come away from a game finding the opposition saying anything other than great things about Anthony Robinson. He just is very impressive on the pitch. And then in the middle of the park, I think Joao Polina, a player that, you know, he's, he's, was Fulham's player of the year last year. He was in with a shout again this year, combative, nasty in midfield, loves a challenge, um, but also super competent on the ball, able to to distribute and dictate the tempo of the game. So I think those are, you know, if you're looking at that spine, if someone up top, someone in the middle and someone in defence, it, it's, it's those three um, who have caused the most problems. And then outside of that, I think that there are some familiar names in there, but I think you, you want to be looking out for, for those three at the moment because they're in, in good form and they always have an ability to affect the game. And also, I mean, one one final one who is still not playing a huge amount for Fulham, but very dangerous when he does come on is Adama Traore, who I think as, as Fulham fans, it's been quite exciting over the past month having him. He's been injured pretty much all season. We've finally been able to call upon him from the bench and he's still as ridiculously quick as ever. And so I would 
you know, be wary as a West Ham fan if if the game starts to get long in the 70th minute. The introduction of Adama Traore is pretty terrifying. He's, he's done us in the past before Traore and, and the Wolves. <laughs> he, he's, he's, he's done us when he's been getting warmed up and he's come on, he's gone down the right cross to it and they've scored. And then and then we make a change at left back to accommodate Traore. The damage is done. But the other co-host, uh, Hammerstack Gonzo, loves Traore. He absolutely <laughs> loves him. I, I, I can't stand him. I think he's all power and pace and no end product and decision making is poor, but that's the type of player Gonzo loves. So he, he'll be, I'm surprised he's forgot he's at Fulham or you mentioned him in the preview actually. But anyway, from your team to my team, what's your thoughts on West Ham? Interesting. I think it's been a really interesting season when looking at West Ham. And I think it's from, from a Fulham perspective, it's always a difficult one because from the outside, things look pretty positive and good, right? You know, it, it's a, a Europa League run, a tough a tough game against Leverkusen on Thursday night, but still in the tie. There, and it's it can't be forgotten how good a side Leverkusen are at the moment. You know, top of the Bundesliga, it's, it's as tough as it gets. Seventh in the league, it looks good, but it's also I'm so also so aware that the word and the feeling throughout West Ham is just one of a little bit of sort of almost apathy, I guess, towards David Moyes and the, and the way he plays. And and I I totally get it. We've had the same thing at Fulham where we, you know, we not the same level of success, but results on the pitch good, but actually enjoyment wasn't at the same level. You know, it, it's more than just winning games of football at times, isn't it? We go for fun and we've had managers in the past who haven't delivered on that entertainment level. And I think Moyes is the same, very pragmatic. And so I, I understand that ill feeling from within West Ham, when you, especially when you consider how exciting some of your players are like Mo Kudus I love I think he's just such a fun exciting footballer Jared Bowen obviously Paqueta players who are so technically gifted and exciting it can sometimes be frustrating to watch them stifled almost and and just feeding off scraps on counter-attacks you know you sort of want to see them do more but from a Fulham perspective we love the sound of seventh and a, a Europa Cup run, you know, it's a, it's 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 a really difficult one to to gauge. But I think you guys have done really well with the rice money. I think you've invested really smartly. And I, there was a worry on my part. I think that when you get a lump sum like that, it can be really difficult to spend it effectively. But Alvarez coming in as well, I think, has been really important in the middle of the park. And as I said, could I say I really enjoy what I thought that was such a smart pick up and I would have loved Fulham to be in for him but I think we were just just outside of our affordability so I, th- I think on on your day it can be so fun to, to watch you guys play because of that front four let's say if you if you push sort of Ward Prowse in there as well but then also the this this idea of you know midweek you guys had 20 odd percent possession and you never I think as a fan, you rarely want to see that, especially in games where you wouldn't necessarily say there's that big a golf in quality. I think it's one thing having 20 odd percent possession against Liverpool and Man City, but outside of that, you rarely want to see see your team do that. That being said, it's quite an effective way to play against Fulham. So <laughs> we're uh, we're rubbish when we have too much possession. So if you do the same thing at the weekend, it might work out for you. <laughs> Do you know? Do you know when um, Britain's Got Talent, um, the judges have the golden buzzer and they go, poof, it explodes and confetti comes down. And people, I wish I had one of them right now for somebody getting it, an opposition fan <laughs> getting it about West Ham fans' complaints regarding David Moyes. Because often when I do these, there's this, and to be fair, they're all respectful and they all say, "I don't watch West Ham, I don't get it." So I'm going to try and stay out the conversation. But you're one of the first ones I've listened to, and I've thought. This man gets it. There's a golden <laughs> golden buzzer, right? You've got the confetti over you. Dan, thank you very much for understanding the gripes from West Ham fans. It's not necessarily results. It's the method, the way, what you're witnessing is the issue rather than the outcome at the end of the game and at the end of the season. Now, that's going to go down refreshingly well with our <laughs> subscribers, so thank you. Um, in regards to David Moyes then, what would... An extreme hypothetical, but if you were a West Ham fan and everything you've said is correct, by the way, what would you be wanting at the end of the season? Moyes has currently got a couple of months to run on his contract. A decision has possibly been made. We just don't know it yet. There's a lot of rumours, but it could also possibly hang in the balance. As a West Ham fan, what would you want to see? I think it's, yeah, interesting 
question and i think part of it would would hinge on i guess would hinge on whether european football remains with you guys but it's such a tricky decision because i've see you see it with other teams who have made decisions like you guys might make where you take a manager who's doing fairly well and and deciding to to upgrade i'm thinking of like palace in the past who have who have been really stable and steady and fans have got a little bit bored of, you know, Roy Hodgson's style of football or Pardew's style of football, and they've gone for someone a bit more progressive and exciting, like a Frank de Boer, and suddenly, seven games into the season, they've not won a game and they've not scored a goal. And it's like, it's there's such a, a risk involved in it, but I, I don't think really, I mean, if you look at the quality of squad you guys have, especially if you keep European football, there would never be any danger of next season anything worse than finishing you know l- lower mid table and is that a risk you take to to grow the club i think it, it very well could be especially when you look at i don't know brighton as an example who have taken punts on managers who play a style of football they want and they stick by it i think it would be a poor decision from west ham if they got rid of david moyes brought someone in who played a completely different style of football more fun and then didn't give that person two or three years to actually see the results of that. So I think that's probably the route I'd want as a West Ham fan is someone exciting coming in, playing exciting football, maybe not getting the same level of results, but seeing that future plan of growth. Um, I think eventually David Moyes is going to walk away from it, isn't he? And I, I don't know how much his heart is necessarily in West Ham as a club or how much it's just his own personal ego. I sometimes get that feeling from David Moyes when you see his press conferences that you get a response from him that feels like he's winning for him and his himself as opposed to the wider club. I don't know, he gets a bit arsy at times and that's the the, the opinion I see. Um, but I think eventually he's going to step away and if if you take stock of the squad right now, it's really well-rounded and strong, maybe a couple of gaps. I'm thinking maybe at centre-back, a potential improvement in there. But otherwise, it's a really well-rounded squad. And so someone could be walking into something pretty strong to start with, which would be good. I can't stop smiling listening to you speak there. <laughs> you, you just get it. Honestly, I can hear all the subscribers clicking the thumbs up button, pushing their golden buzzer, thinking about time someone gets it. Some Someone else says Moyes should go from West. Well, he didn't say that. I'm going to put in the, cl- in the title for a little bit of clickbait. Pool and fan says West Ham should replace David Moyes. There you go. That's the title of the video <laughs> sorted. Um, but this is going to go down a tree. Anyway, let's turn our attentions to Sunday then. How do you see the game going? I mean, we've got a horrific record away at West Ham. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter, you know, Pre, pre-London pre Stadium or post, it's it's not a great record. I think the the 5-0 earlier in the season was a bit of a false dawn. We were in a good place. You guys weren't in a great place. I think we've come off a game against Newcastle where I would expect this game to play out pretty similarly. I think we will have a lot of possession of the ball, which we struggle with because we at our best, at Fulham at their best, play really quickly and shift the ball smartly in midfield and bring in the wide players and the fullbacks. And the deeper a team sits, the slower Fulham gets. And we're not very good at unpicking a defence. We, we we are fantastic in a transition, but if a defence sits back against us, our only real answer is to swing crosses into the box. And we came unstuck against Newcastle because you've got Dan Byrne and Fabian Scher in there who are going to win every header. So we were sort of aimlessly putting crosses into the box and getting nowhere. And I worry that we might see the same thing on Sunday. That being said, the added effect of your legs being a little bit weary from that Europa game, is it gives us. I think it gives us a chance. I'm not feeling overly positive. We've also got a horrific record away from home. I think to, to give you guys some optimism, we've won two games away from home all season. <laughs> the first one being... Everton on the first day of the season and the other one being at Old Trafford. So it's it's not been great on the road for us. But I, I'm never I'm never one to predict Fulham to lose. So I think we'll we'll go for a we'll go for a one all draw, I think. But I, I would struggle to see Fulham running away with this one. And especially after the way things went last season at your your place. We we started fantastically. Andreas Pereira scored really early on, a great finish. Uh, and then it all went to pot and unraveled quite quickly. Uh, so wouldn't expect 
to uh, see anything too dissimilar to that. But I think you will expect to see Fulham have a lot of possession, play some nice, attractive football. It's just whether we're good enough to break you down and whether we can deal with your pace and quality on the counter-attack. I think that's the, you know, as with most of your games this season, I imagine that's how they tend to pan out. Hope, hope from Dan for <laughs> West Ham fans. Right then, um, I'm going to ask him a really geeky question about ticket price. So you don't want to know the answer. Now's the time to disappear. But before you do, please do drop a like on and subscribe to Hammers Chat. I'll put a link to Dan's social media profiles in the description below. So if you wish to follow Dan on social media, you can do. Right, Dan, in the preview, I made a mistake trying to chat about Fulham ticketing without knowing the full extent of the Fulham ticketing situation. But recall almost like a, a, a mini protest halfway through the season almost which is quite abnormal it's usually towards the end when ticket prices come out and stuff so what's the issue and what's the complaints from Fulham fans in regards to ticketing at your football club yeah it, it's it, it's a complicated one because the reason it came sort of midway through the season was that we had a couple of big home games early on in the season which had some pretty shocking individual match ticket pricing on them you know we're looking at games where the cheapest ticket you could get was in the 60 to 70 pound mark which which for me i think is is pretty disgusting for for football and it's just not on and we were in told by the club that it's a one-off thing it was a big game we've heard listened we're altering it and then we didn't have a big game at craven cottage for a few weeks and then as soon as another one came around and the ticket price was released, it was in the same ballpark. So, you know, coming off last week against Newcastle, the, the cheapest ticket in the ground was £71. And it's just pricing Fulham fans out. And, and, and that's where it's really struck a chord with us. It's not necessarily at the moment the season ticket holders who are being impacted. Just about our season ticket prices are fair. We saw an 18% increase this season, which was a lot, which was a lot. Um, but it was from a position where they were really okay, fairly like priced. championship prices, okay. exactly. So we had a freeze, and then but on that that eighteen percent rise raised a lot of eyebrows, and it's 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 now the fact that we just know I think as season ticket holders that not everyone can go every week. There are people who want to go a few times a year because that's what they can afford. There are people who can only visit London a few times a year because they live outside. They live outside the UK, whatever it is, and. Pricing like that has just meant that we've been overtaken as a London club by by tourists in in the home end. And I think probably even worse, a lot of away fans sitting in the home end. So when we play sort of the traditional big six, you throw in Newcastle into that because of how well they travel. We had a lot of opposition fans in the home end because Fulham fans aren't willing to pay it. But a United fan who lives in London and never gets to go to Old Trafford will happily pay £70 to to go and watch them in London. So I think there's there's one aspect there is that genuine Fulham fans are being priced out. And that's really, you know, as a, as a collective, we hate that because it's such a, a family club. We're a really small community, you know, in comparison to a lot of other clubs in London. The, the you know, the wide Fulham fan base is probably only about 40,000 people. You know, it's, it's, it's such a small catchment area to be a Fulham fan. And then the additional thing is that we know that this means that season ticket prices are going to go up as well. At first, they target the, the match day tickets, and then it will be season tickets. And so the protest was there. The dialogue with the club is poor. Um, and I don't expect things to improve anytime soon. And so I think you know, when people come to Craven Cottage and, and laugh at the atmosphere, one, it's fair. You know, the, Sometimes the atmosphere at Craven Cottage is poor. But so I think part of it and a large part of it is because Fulham fans can't go anymore because it's too expensive. And I think that's that's the sad thing. And I think something that, as a football collective, we should all care about. It's happening at loads of clubs, isn't it? You know, if it's happening at Spurs, it's happening at City, it's happening at West Ham. And I think as, as fans, it's great that we speak about it because eventually we're going to need to really do something to stop it because it's getting so commercial and global that eventually the the core support of football clubs don't matter anymore because they're never going to pay as much as someone who is visiting London for the week and wants to go and watch a, a Premier League game, you know, so. Completely that, agree. We've got, we've, got, we've got a very similar circumstances at West Ham, so much so that sort of unofficially, sometimes the a top source at the club may talk to a certain website and a quote comes out and it's believed to be David Sullivan, although we can't prove it, it's believed to be David Sullivan, and when the season ticket price increases came out this year, and it varies 
per person from a handful of percent up to about mid-teens percent. Um, and they're also moving the concessions. So the concessions have been all around the ground from day one. And they're moving up to band six, which is the lowest band, which is in the upper tiers at the very back. So essentially, if you're an elderly person, you're cashing in on your loyalty to the football club. You're now 66. You can get your discount. You supported the club for 60 years of your life. Your reward is go sit. So those who have less who have more mobility issues and worse eyesight, go sit in the seat furthest away, highest up, up there to get your concession. And so there's a bit of a, a bit. Also, the quote from the chairman is basically like, "Our season tickets are too cheap. We would do it differently if we could do it again." Um, and they want last season ticket holders so they can cash in on, as you say, the, the, the person that goes once. Because, for an example, um, Gonzo, the guy that loves the damage, he sold. He couldn't attend the Spurs game. He sold his ticket back to the club on the ticket exchange, got a handful of quid back, and they sold it for over £100. So the club made over a £90 profit on Gonzo not yeah. attending that one game. Uh, so seeing tickets might pay £40 a ticket. On average, they can be selling that seat for over 100 quid a ticket for a lot of games. But for the big ones, like you say, but there's more and more big games. It used to be Category A was Man United and Liverpool. They're now Category AA, and yeah. Newcastle is Category A. So they've actually added a more expensive category to accommodate the sort of Sky Sports 6, if you like, but then they can shoehorn the likes of Newcastle and Aston Villa into the old category. Um, yeah, there's just squeezing, squeezing fans more and more. And it's happening at every club. And I'm seeing every fan base complain. But I'm yet to see like a uniformed campaign from all fans. Like there was against the Sky Sports Super 6 when they tried to bugger off to that European League. Everybody got together. And I think something like that is possibly on the horizon again from all football fans. Because you've got, you know, the price cap for the away tickets it's almost like is there going to eventually be one for home tickets as well if i feel like we're well away from that but it just feels like there's a lot of disgruntled fans with the same complaints at every club at the minute so that's why the fool and protest earlier in the season caught my attention there was nothing happening at west ham then but i felt like there was going to be something happening at west yeah. ham because money they want money but anyway dan this has been the most relatable opposition preview <laughs> And all season and for some time it's been the longest one as well but i think it's going to go down a treat with our subscribers so thank you very much for giving up your time really appreciate it it's been a pleasure thanks for having me it's been yeah look, looking forward to sunday hopefully a bit of sun in stratford would be nice we're going to go down to to crate brewery get some pizzas and beers and then stroll down to the ground hopefully well, enjoy it, and hopefully you're not at the, the back of the upper tier with mobility issues <laughs> and eyesight issues. Um, but enjoy the game anyway. And you guys at home, if you've enjoyed this video, drop a like on it. It's going to you. Dan's social media profile is in, in the description below. Get following him. I'll catch up with you in a bit.